Good morning. Uh, I love that song. Just have to sing that one. <laughs> no, I just it's that one's very special to me. When Rob sings to break every chain, I name those chains that are holding my family down right now. And so thank you. That one really, like I say, sorry, I'm just a little emotional here, but anyways, I'd like to welcome everybody here. As Rob said, I have been taking a homiletics class uh, through a Horizon uh, Seminary, and as part of my final assignment, I have the privilege of bringing the word to you, so um, thank you for sharing in this assignment with me. I'm just going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are here. Thank you so much that you break the chains of those things that are holding us down. Oh, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, use me. Thank you for the privilege of being able to share your word. Lord, I pray that it wouldn't be me speaking, that it would be you, that your words would come out. And Lord, where there's something that should not be said, that you would close my lips. So all we want to do today is glorify and honor you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, Colin Weed, I've been going to this church here probably ooh, 15, 16 years, I think. Um been working with youth probably for the last 12 or 13 years. Um, some here, I've seen Micah there, a little grow up right through youth and stuff, so that's really cool. Welcome here. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, so that, that's, I guess that's kind of where I've been at doing doing this, and God challenged me to, actually challenged me probably years and years ago to do some something more, so this is part of that something more. So anyways, while I was preparing and praying and, and, and uh, seeking God and what he wanted me to say, uh, it was really hard. <laughs> There's so many things that you want to say, so many things you want to do. But I think what I needed to hear the most is where I went. And that was finding joy in the midst of trials. In John 16.33, uh, the latter part of the verse, it talks about there's going to be trouble. Not that there may be trouble, or that it could happen, but trouble is coming. Now think about that trouble you're, you've faced or are facing. What is it? What hardship has got you down? Is it a wayward son or daughter? Is it financial despair? Or did you get a call from the doctor who is the bearer of bad news? Or maybe your son just told you that he can't take it anymore and wants to end his life to stop the pain. You could also be that one in pain. So where do we go from here? How do we get through the hell we find ourselves in? I remember a saying that a guest speaker once said, when you're going through hell, don't stop. Keep going. But right at the end of that verse, it says, take heart. For I have overcome the world. So that means that anything that this world can throw at you, Jesus has defeated on the cross. Romans 8 talks about the world being set free. And later on the cha in that chapter, it says that we are more than conquerors. Which means whatever you are facing, 
no matter how big that mountain looks, you are going to conquer it. Matthew 19, 26 tells us that things, all things are possible with God. The Bible tells us not only are we going to conquer our trials, but we are to have joy through them. I was thinking, are you kidding me? I'm going through hell and you want me to be happy? You want me to have joy? But James 1 verse 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you are facing trials of many kinds. This may look impossible, but as Jesus said in Matthew 19, all things are possible with God. Let's take a look at how. The first thing I think we need to do is define joy. So what better thing to do than look it up in a dictionary? The world, or the dictionary, defines joy as an emotion invoked by well-being, success, or good fortune. All these things seem to be linked to some kind of happiness in the immediate. So what happens when your health well-being, job, is gone. Is your joy gone? Do you have to wait for your success to come back before you have joy again? And while I was studying, uh, I came across a definition by Piper. Many of you probably know him and have listened to lots of his podcasts. But anyways, Piper says that joy or Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. So then, it is a feeling or an emotion in the soul not the physical body. Although it may have side effects, like a smile, an extra bounce to your step, or even tears of joy. For those of like me who are a crier. Anyways. Um, now this is something that we can't produce. It must be from the Holy Spirit. I'll try to give you a little bit of an illustration to See if I can clarify this a little bit. Okay, let's say you're working at a 7-Eleven, Saskatoon. Someone comes in and decides he's going to rob the place. So now fear and panic set in. Where did these emotions come from? Well, they were from something that came, they came from that situation. Uh, you, you didn't have to sit there and think, oh, okay, let's process this. This masked guy has got a weapon, and he's yelling, oh, oh, I should be scared. No, it came as a result of the situation. Um, uh, now, that emotion was a result of something beyond your control. Uh, same with the feeling in the soul that comes from the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit bring about this feeling or emotion? By revealing Jesus' beauty. And his beauty in his, is revealed through his word. So as we experience Jesus in his word and in the world, we see more um, we see more of his, sorry, kind of lost my spot here. So as we experience Jesus through his word and in the world, we see more of 
of his beauty as I am really sorry I'll just skip that anyways basically as we see his word and as we see him through his word and the beauty that he gives in that um, the Holy Spirit brings apart this emotion in the soul that Piper's talking about and it's something that's more than just immediate like we see in the dictionary's definition it is everlasting and why is it everlasting is because it's from God and God is everlasting so let's tuck that definition away of, of Piper's and uh We'll bring it out a little bit later. And so, as I was studying this subject, I came across a verse that might help us with this journey. And I'd like to start uh, with First Peter four twelve to thirteen, where it says, "Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you." But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So Peter tells us not to be surprised that we will face suffering. And as believers, suffering, trials, and hardship will come. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So, we know that the devil's on the prowl. He wants us to give up and fail. We know he's going to throw everything he can at us. This is why earlier in chapter 4, Peter tells us, do not be surprised. If we are wholeheartedly seeking the Lord, then we should not be surprised, but we should expect trials. John 1633 starting in the middle tells us in this world you will have trouble but take heart I have overcome the world this tells us that trouble or trials are coming but it does leave us with some hope Jesus has overcome the world there is nothing new nothing that can come your way that Jesus has not defeated or that Jesus has defeated, sorry, alone, this should give us hope and joy. That what we are facing, financial difficulties, anxiety, or that mountain that seems impossible, whatever your case may be, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has already defeated it on the cross. But I'd like to take a look at a couple of people who have faced trials. The first is the Apostle Peter. Now a little bit about him. In Acts uh, chapter 12, we find Peter is imprisoned by Herod simply for the fact that it pleased the Jews. In Acts chapter 4, we see the temple guards arrest him for his kindness to the cripple at the beautiful gate. This is where John and Peter uh, meet the beggar, and the beggar's asking him for money. And he says, we don't have any. But what we do have, we give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, get up and walk. And the beggar's healed. Again, we see Peter and other apostles arrested in chapter 5. Um, but this time, they are also flogged. Not only did Peter feel honored for being disgraced for the sake of the gospel... But 541 also says they rejoiced as well. So where does this joy in the midst of trials come from? I'd like to take you through a little journey to see if we can find the answer. So if you brought your Bibles, I'd like to read from 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9. <clears throat> Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, 
he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that never perish well, that can never perish spoil or fade kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time in this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief of all kinds these have to come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may be proved genuine and may result in praise glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed though you have not seen him you love him and even though you do not see him now you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls <clears throat> so I'd like to start with verse, verse 6 in this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while you may have had to suffer all kinds of trials what are we to greatly rejoice in life is hard why should I be rejoicing well let's jump back up to the beginning of that passage we can rejoice in the fact that we have a new birth a living hope through Jesus death and resurrection we can rejoice that we have an inheritance that can never perish fade or spoil this alone should be cause for celebration that we are not left to our sin which only leads to death rejoice take joy in the fact that we have a way through Jesus and this uh, and this living hope will not fade it doesn't matter what this world takes from you if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that is one thing it cannot take so rejoice I know that life is hard and filled with trials but just like gold is refined by fire to draw out the dross we are defined by trials so that our faith can be proved genuine and result in praise glory and honor but I do think the icing on the cake for this passage is though you have not seen him you love him and even though you do not see him now you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy I think Peter found uh, I think the joy that Peter found through his trials can be found here in this passage he knew God's mercy he had a new birth and inheritance through Jesus he believed in the Savior and in turn was filled with joy so let's pull back out Piper's definition and see how it applies here a feeling or an emotion in the soul Peter was joyful produced by the Holy Spirit Peter believed in Jesus and was filled with joy as the beauty of Christ is revealed the mercy that Jesus has given Peter a new birth a new hope through his death and resurrection I guess we can say that Peter's joy came from knowing Jesus and his salvation now the second person I'd like to take a look quick look at is Paul second Corinthians tells us that Paul had been imprisoned he had been whipped near death received 39 lashes five times been stoned beaten shipwrecked and the list goes on so if anyone had the right to be bitter I think Paul had a good case but he wasn't 
Philippians 4, 12 to 13 says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret to be content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I believe that this secret to Paul's contentment can be found on his reliance on God's sovereignty. I believe that Paul found his joy knowing Christ and his salvation. Where in Philippians 3, it talks about Paul being a Hebrew of Hebrews, the, the cream of the crop, the top dog, if that's what you want to use. But he said it was nothing in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ. But I'd also have to say that his joy came from God's sovereignty. Paul knew that no matter what the circumstance he found himself in, that God was going to take care of him. Now, let's go back to the end of verse 13 in uh, Philippians 4. And it says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul was confident that Jesus was going to give him strength to face all odds, knowing that God would supply for him. Because if you read on in the chapter, you will see in verse 19, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Paul knew that, knew that he was going to be taken care of no matter what. That there was nothing this world can throw at him that God wasn't going to see him through. We see this when we look at Philippians one verse six being confident in this that he who began a good work will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus God was not done with Paul just like he's not done with you so no matter what we are going through we can be confident that he is still molding us shaping us more and more into the image of Christ sometimes that molding takes place through trials. As we learned earlier in Peter, that these trials have to come to prove our faith genuine. Sometimes these lessons are hard. But ask anyone who's gone through a hard trial if they would ever change or trade away what they've learned and that connection they've had to God, and I don't think you'd find one. Along with these truths of God's sovereignty, that God gives strength, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, God supplies, uh, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, and God's not done being confident in this, that he who began a good work will carry it through to completion. I think we need to look at one more aspect of God's sovereignty when it comes to joy in the midst of trials. And that would be Romans 8.28. And I know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. For this verse, uh, this verse for me, I hold very close to my heart. Because it doesn't matter what my family is going through, I rest on God to work it out for good. It doesn't mean I have to like the situation or even be happy about it. But I can take joy. And take joy in the fact that God has a plan and he knows what he's doing. For Matthew 10, 29 to 31 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father. And even the very hairs on your head are numbered. 
So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And earlier in chapter 6, where Jesus is teaching about worry, he talks about feeding the birds of the air. Now, if he cares this much about sparrows, how much more does he care about you who were created in his image? We can rejoice that God has a plan. We can rest on God's promises. So whether your joy comes from knowing Christ, that you are a new creation, you have an inheritance that never fades or spoils, that is kept by God like we find in Peter, or you find joy in God's sovereignty that he will give you strength, he will supply your needs, he will carry you through to the end, and that he always works it out for good for those who love him. Like we find in Paul's writings, we can rejoice that we have a mighty Savior who will never leave us or forsake us. Now some of you might think that this joy is unattainable. I am here to tell you that it's not. In my own personal experience, I can say that the Holy Spirit will bring you joy if you let him. I know there's nothing that this world can throw at me that Christ hasn't already defeated. I know he loves me, and he has a plan for me. And I can tell you right now that my family is walking through hell dealing with issues of depression, financial, everything in between. I know that everything that my family is going through right now is not a waste. God has a purpose and a reason. And I will rejoice that he is in control. I may not like his plan at the moment. I may even shake my fists and yell at God. But at the end of the day, I know he has a plan. I know that it is far better than anything that I can do. So as hard as it is to do, give God your mountain. Stop drowning in the sea of hopelessness. Let God take control and rest in his plan and take joy in his salvation. all I got. <laughs> so if you want to...